My name is Sean. The project I work on is called Pion. Pion is a open source collective for building real-time communication software in Go. It's completely driven by individuals. If you're ever interested in getting involved in open source, we'd love to have you work on the project. Um, we have multiple different companies. We have um, students that want to that learn Go or real-time communication more. And we have all these different types of communities as well. We have, a, we have people that are working on security that are interested in DTLS. We have people that are just interested in building conferencing software. And we have robotics, just to name a few. So we'd love to have you involved. And we'll talk about later where you can find us. So if you're not familiar with real-time communication, Go is making a big splash in this space. And here are some of the companies and the projects that they're building. Format is making it so you can remotely control robots over the internet. So here's one of the Boston Dynamics spot, and it has the format agent on it. And with that, I can now control it over the internet. So in the bottom right corner, you can see that I'm using my mouse and keyboard to move things around. And with that, over the internet, I'm able to move the robot up and down, and I'm able to transmit the audio and video directly into my browser. Headroom is making it so taking conferencing in, in to the next level. So you can analyze, you know, when you hold up your hand, it'll automatically say that you're raised, it'll do speech to text, and it can measure the, um, you know, how much eye contact has been made and other things. It's what can we do with all of these great libraries in Go and audio and video processing. PyPacker allows you to play games with other people directly in the browser. So on a remote host, we have this um, NES emulator, a Super Nintendo, Game Boy, and it brings all these classic retro games together and makes them able to play. Um, they're using Pion to run on the remote host, and then you're able to connect directly. It kind of recreates that sitting on the couch next to a friend experience. Here's another is Strive it has a peer-to-peer -peer CDN. Using real-time communication peer-to-peer, -peer, they connect people together that are in the same network. So, so you only have to download a, a video file remotely once. So you have the CDN Edge server. I download my video file once, and then I share it among my users. So you don't have to use an internet connection to download the same file 10 times for the people that are in the same network. So what is WebRTC? You know, we talk about all these like really cool big things you can build, but what exactly does it get you? WebRTC is originally envisioned as a protocol for browsers. So it gives you end-to-end -end sec secure connection between peers. So two browsers, they're able to establish a connection directly. You don't even have to go through a, through a server, and it's completely secure. So there's no optional. It's not like HTTP, HTTPS. If you're using WebRTC, it's a secure connection. And then you have two things that you can exchange. You can either exchange multimedia. So I can do two audio, three video tracks. There's, really, there's no limit at all. And binary data. And binary data with WebRTC is very interesting because it can be lossy and unordered. So if you think if you're building a real-time system like a video game, you don't care where the player was two seconds ago. You just want to hear what's happening right now. So it allows you to build really interesting systems with that. The other really exciting thing about WebRTC is how widely available it is. So if I have two WebRTC agents and they're exchanging binary data, I could have one in Python. I could have one in TypeScript. I could have one in Java and one in Go. I think WebRTC is a great chance to have this you know, cross-language communication without having some kind of central server. So a lot of issues today is you know, if you want to have two languages communicate, you have to run some kind of pub sub server or you exchange things via HTTP. With WebRTC, I can connect these two processes together directly and start exchanging binary data and maybe send JSON over or whatever I want. And if you're curious about WebRTC really works, the Pi community is working on a book called WebRTC for the Curious. And we talk not just about the public APIs, but a deep dive on the protocols and how things actually work. We also have some interviews with the RFC authors and the people that actually made WebRTC so you can understand the intention of it and like what the purpose and the design of things. And also like a WebRTC in practice. If you need help debugging or teach you the sharp edges, I think a lot of those things come in handy if um, you, know, you don't want to have to learn those things in production. So we provide this resource for you. So what does WebRTC solve? You know, I promise all these really interesting things, but until you hit these problems, you probably don't appreciate that, um, like how great WebRTC is. And another thing is you don't even realize some of these problems are solvable. So a lot of times users think, oh, I, I want to exchange this file with another person, but we're in two separate networks, so I have to upload it so they can, we can both exchange it. But that's actually um, not true. I can connect two users with no public IP who are in completely different networks. And it uses this technique called NAT traversal. So every time that you send a packet out to a public server, your NAT 
will establish a temporary hole. And that temporary hole allows the server to send messages back to you. But you could also share that temporary hole with other users and they can send messages back to you. So let's say you say, send a packet to google.com, your NAT opens up a temporary hole so Google can respond to you. But that temporary hole can also be exchanged and told to other users and they can send messages then to you. And what WebRTC uses is something called a stun server. And so the stun server, you send a packet out to and you say, hi, please send some data back to me and also tell me what is my public IP and what is this temporary hole that's established. If you've ever done port forwarding, maybe to play a video game before, um, it's essentially like an automatic port forward. WebRTC also solves the problem of staying connected on the move. So let's say you originally take a call and you're on Wi-Fi, but you decide to walk outside. WebRTC provides this thing called ICE Restart, so it can actually measure you know, the connectivity, the quality of the connection, it can switch connections on the fly and always pick the best route. Um, if you're using TCP, the, there is multipath TCP, uh, but the nice thing is with ICE Restart is it switches and like the actual, the, um, the user land is aware of what's happening. So I can switch, you know, let's say if I switch from Wi-Fi to cellular, I can say like, okay, like I need to send lower quality video because, you know, I'm on a metered connection and stuff like that. There's a lot of powerful things you can do if you're aware that you're switching networks and you're aware of the quality of that network. Another really common problem is that users will sit down and they'll want to measure, they'll, they'll want to say, how much bandwidth do I have available? Because that's the quality of video I want to upload. But that's not how the real world works. Um, when you measure, you could be measuring when the network is really overloaded and it could say you have less available. Or you could measure when the network is really underutilized and as more people come on the network, you have less bandwidth available. So here's an example where I originally measured and I thought I had 50 megabits a second, but as more users come on at different hops, all of a sudden that reduces the actual bandwidth available between me. WebRTC has receiver feedback and what that allows you to do is implement congestion control. So when I receive media from a sender, I send responses like I got these many packets, I lost these many packets and I have this much delay. With all this information, I can actually adjust the bit rate and make sure that I get the best experience possible. So as, you know, if you've ever done a call over WebRTC, you'll watch the quality will fluctuate as the conditions of the network change. Another popular thing that people use WebRTC to solve is the head of line blocking. So with TCP, the first message that you send has to be delivered before message plus one. But the nice thing about WebRTC is that you choose what is retransmitted. So let's say that you can send a message like telemetry or metadata, something that isn't important. If it doesn't get delivered, you don't have to try to send it again. You can mark that message with a max retransmits of zero and new data now flows unblocked and delivery but let's say that you do care about something, you can guarantee that it's been delivered by resending and the send a receiver will say, okay, I've, I've got message with this transmission number. Another really popular thing about WebRTC, it's actually a bundle of existing protocols. So if you've ever worked in VoIP, you've probably heard of RTP and RTCP and SRTP. Um, it's really easy to bundle all these existing things and you can hook WebRTC up to an existing VoIP system or you can easily bring in a call from a plain old telephone system right into your WebRTC call. Being able to bridge all these things is super powerful. So now that you're convinced that WebRTC is super exciting, you're going to build something, you go and check out Pion, and this is how easy it is to build something. So with WebRTC, since it's peer-to-peer, -peer, we have to exchange some kind of metadata to say, okay, this is where I'm located, these are the codecs I support, and this is what I want to talk about. And this is known as signaling. So what you do is the person that wants to start the call creates an offer. And the person that wants to connect to the call creates an answer. WebRTC is always a one-to-one -one connection. So here we are on the offering side. I create a peer connection. I create an offer. And I send off my offer. At the end of this file, you see we get the remote session, the remote description. And we call set remote description. So now we have just with this six lines of code. And you'd have, those, you'd have the equivalent on the other side you've established a peer-to-peer -peer connection. You can now, once you're established, create a data channel. You can create as many data channels as you want. I think there's actually a limit of 65,000. And each of those data channels can have settings that control like the lifetime, um, the priority of it, and other things so that you can tailor them to like what the purpose is. So on the first line, I create the data channel. And then when the data channel is open, I send the message, hello world. On the other side, I have an on data channel handler. And when a new data channel opens, I print the name of the data channel and I print the messages as they come across. Really exciting thing about WebRTC is since it's available everywhere, you can actually write your WebRTC code in Go 
and then deploy it to WebAssembly. So that's what I've done here is I've taken my existing example and I've built it for WebAssembly and now I use it right in the browser. Sending video is easy as well. You create a track and then you start writing some media to that track. Here we are, uh, IVF is a file format that just contains raw media data. So we're just reading frame by frame and then writing it to our WebRTC connection. And then on the other side, we're receiving frame by frame. And WebRTC has all this goodness built in where it will measure the amount of bandwidth available and tell you like this is what you should do and it will handle loss and other things like that. So here's some of the really exciting things that are being built with Pion and open source. NS Remote allows you to send the video data right from a Nintendo Switch into a virtual reality headset. So a user has um, put Pion on a device that captures the frames from the Nintendo Switch and then sends it over the network. So they can sit with a Nintendo Switch in their hand, but they get a full immersive experience with the headset. Um, it does these cool things like because you're on the same network, you're not paying for the bandwidth, you know, to have to send this over the internet. And, um, you know, this could also go to other devices, you know, because WebRTC is an open protocol. You could send the Nintendo Switch into your browser. You could send it to your TV if it has a WebRTC agent. Um, it's kind of a ubiquitous protocol at this point. WebRTC is also great for security cameras. So there's some existing protocols for security cameras. You have RTSP or maybe just plain RTP. But one of the issues is that that doesn't handle NAT traversal and it also doesn't have a like, there's not a like required security for that. So RTSP, you could opt in to have encryption, but with WebRTC, since encryption is mandatory, I think that it's bringing a lot of great security to the space. Neko allows you to run a browser on a remote host and then have multiple people connect to it. So you could watch a movie with a friend, you could browse a website with another person, or you could, you know, um, use this to run a heavy web process on a remote host. You know, you could run Slack and watch YouTube videos and stuff like that, things that you don't want to do locally if you don't have the processing power. Go, you know, again, just like the early example earlier with Format, here's an open source implementation of that where they put a Pion directly on the drone, and now you're able to control it by dragging things in a web UI and then they're sending the video frames right over the internet. WebRTC conferencing doesn't just have to be in the browser. Here you're running a Go agent directly in your terminal and it's doing a encoding and decoding and so now I'm seeing another user's video frames just in ASCII. And if you're familiar with um, a lot of the cloud gaming process, projects, we now have that with an open source version, Cloud Morph. You can get that right off GitHub and you can play um, Diablo 2, you can play StarCraft, and it's also great for running like heavy applications that are difficult to set up. You can, you know, spin up a remote host and run something in Wine that's really difficult to run and set up and then tear that host down. So you don't have to, you know, you can play across different, different devices. You can play it on devices that don't have enough GPU and things like that. And I see a lot of promise with WebRTC and exchanging like terminals. So here we have WebTTY, which allows me to connect my terminal to a browser and I don't need to run it through a central host, and I actually don't even need to be on the internet since it's peer-to-peer. -peer. I think there's a lot of promise here if someone was to come up with a project that could um, allow you to you know, connect two hosts or maybe two containers without having to worry with, about central processing, and you could have it be multi-cloud, and there's a lot of interesting things here that I don't think has been fully explored yet. Snowflake is an open source project by Tor that uses WebRTC for censorship circumvention. So instead of having to download the full Tor browser, you can just access a website via WebRTC and the data channel. And this is great because if you know your ISP or your network provider or maybe a government wants to block Web Tor, it's a lot harder now with WebRTC because you have all of this conferencing traffic and other important things that go via this protocol. So it's much harder to filter and identify. Web Wormhole allows you to exchange files via WebRTC. And now you've seen a lot of examples like this just in the browser, but now that we have a Go agent, it brings up a, a lot of um, interesting possibilities. You know, I can, I can send a file directly from my server to my desktop. I can exchange things via my phone. Um, Go brings it to a lot of new platforms where having a full browser wasn't possible. And then Pion is being used for a lot of interesting um, conferencing things as well. So here is a virtual reality space where people's heads are imposed upon their avatars. And they did some really cool things where they actually had um, Shakespeare that was performed in this. And that's great for you know things that you couldn't do in the physical world like quick costume changes or changing the stage. 
um, you can quickly do in VR. So I think it opens up a lot of interesting possibilities. So if you go and build something with Pion, I'd love to hear about it. Um, we have github.com slash Pion, awesome Pion, with a list of all of these things that I think are really promising and exciting. And we'd love to have yours as well. And Pion needs you. So if you're interested in getting involved, um, we'd love to have you. On the next slide, we have the Slack and email, but these are kind of the reasons that I love working in open source is you get to empower those that are helping the internet. So Tor, IPFS, and there's a lot of great projects out there. And you gain deep web RTC knowledge. It's really great to work on Pion and learn this stuff and then not have to learn it when you know, you're solving a production issue. And in that same vein, it's a fun challenge where you pick the goals. If you find a particular part of WebRTC interesting, here's your chance to deep dive on that and just enjoy that. So that's where you can find the Pion project on GitHub. And then we have a Slack on, Go on the Gopher Slack. And then a Twitter where I share, share interesting project updates. So I hope you found that interesting. And please like reach out anytime. And um, I hope to hear from you. Thank you.